Hello and welcome to this multi-part series on Patrick Henry. This particular installment is titled Quick Study, His Views on Freedom and Faith. Let's begin with the arrival of his father. In 1607, English planters came to Jamestown. In the 1620s and 1670s, Plymouth Pilgrims settled in the Massachusetts area. The Scotch-Irish came in the 1700s and 1760s, and his father, John Henry, is a part of this migration from Scotland to Virginia in the 1720s. Patrick Henry was born on May 29, 1736, 16 years later. He first attended local schools, and then he was tutored by his father. Early in his career, he began to work as a planner, but the soil was poor, and he was not very successful. He then pursued a mercantile store, but was not successful at that either. Finally, he studied law while continuing to farm. In his married life, in 1754, at age 18, he married Sarah Shelton. They had six children together, but unfortunately Sarah got terribly sick and died in 1775, and his biography talks about his tender loving care for Sarah as she quickly demised. Two years later, in 1777, Patrick remarried Dorothea Dandridge, and they had 11 children together. In his political life, back when he was married to Sarah, just 10 years into his first marriage, in 1765, he was elected to the state legislature for the first time, and this is called the House of Burgesses in Virginia. Within nine days, he had introduced the Stamp Act resolutions. It was said of those resolutions, it was in a language so extreme that some Virginians said it smacked of treason. So early on, he was known as a lover of freedom and liberty. His peers in Virginia would have been uh, Thomas Jefferson and Peyton Randolph. He later became friends with the patriot and liberty-loving friend Samuel Adams in Massachusetts. Peyton Randolph is an interesting individual. He was the cousin of Thomas Jefferson, and he was the president of the First and Second Congresses. The British wanted to capture him and hang him for his uh, role in these Congresses. Had he lived, he would have likely been as famous as George Washington, but he died in 1775. Sam Adams up in Massachusetts said, you know what we need? We need to start a Committees of Correspondence. And in 1772, he started one in Massachusetts. The purpose was to coordinate the activities of the colonies related to the British. He said this about the rights of the colonists, that they may be best understood by reading and carefully studying the great lawgiver and head of the church. What he meant by that was by reading the Bible and applying it. In March 1773, Patrick Henry and Thomas Jefferson and Richard, Richard Henry Lee agreed to these committees of correspondence, and they started a Virginia version of this. Good thing they did, because several months later, December 16, 1773, the Boston Tea Party took place. 342 chests of tea from three ships were thrown into the harbor. In May 1774, the British uh, arrived in Boston, and British General Gage arrived with four regiments. In September 5, 1774, the first Continental Congress meets in Philadelphia. Fifty-six delegates representing 12 of the 13 colonies met there. Notably, the first act of Congress was to pray. The Congressional Library of Congress says they prayed fervently for America and for this Congress. Who can realize the emotions with which they turned imploringly to heaven for divine interposition? Also, what was read on that day was Psalm 35. It was the assigned reading for the day. It said, Contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Take up shield and buckler and arise and come to my aid. They thought this was an act of God's providence, affirming and guiding their meeting, that that psalm would be read on that day. Patrick Henry was first to speak. He said that British oppression had made one nation of the several colonies, so that he no longer considered himself a Virginian, but an American. He recommended that the colonies be considered as a federation of independent states, and this was agreed to. By, seven, by September 17th, the Congress declared its opposition to the repressive acts of Parliament, saying they are not to be obeyed. This catalytically caused individual Congresses to take place in the various colonies. And so in 1774 and 1775, provincial Congresses took place, first in Massachusetts, where they were preparing to defend themselves, and then in March in Virginia, where they were likewise preparing for their for defense. It was at this Virginia Congress that Patrick Henry rose to his feet and gave his liberty or give me death speech. Sir, we are not weak if we make a proper use of the means which the God of nature hath placed in our power. 
Besides, sir, we shall not fight our battles alone. There is a just God who presides over the destinies of nations and who will raise up friends to fight our battles for us. Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, Almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. And with those words, Patrick Henry sealed his fame in the annals of American history. In August 1775, he was commissioned as a colonel of the 1st Virginia Regiment. At the outset of the Revolutionary War, he led a militia against the British in defense of some di disputed gunpowder, which later began, began to be known as the Gunpowder Incident. In 1776, he was elected by the new state legislature as the first governor of Virginia. They were one-year terms, and he was twice re-elected, serving until 1779. The new state law limited governors to three terms in succession, and, that re and then it required a four-year break, but Henry would later come and resume uh, to serve again and became the longest-serving governor in the United States. As a part of his role as governor, he helped craft the Virginia Bill of Rights on June 12, 1776, and Article 16 reads this way, that religion or the duty which we owe to our Creator and the manner of discharging it can be directed only by reason and conviction, not by force or violence. And therefore, all men are equally entitled to the free exercise of religion according to the dictates of conscience, and that it is the mutual duty of all to practice Christian forbearance, love, and charity toward each other. An ardent supporter of states' rights, Henry was an outspoken critic of the U.S. Constitution. He worried that the untested office of the presidency could devolve into a monarchy. But the Constitution passed and he was then instrumental in having the Bill of Rights adopted to amend the new Constitution and give additional protections to individual rights, those including the freedom of religion, the freedom of speech, the freedom of assembly, the freedom of press, the freedom from unlawful search or seizure, the freedom co from coercive force and the right to self-defense, a right to a speedy and fair trial. And then he went on to say, or the Bill of Rights went on to say, that whatever is not mentioned as a constitutional power was a freedom reserved for the states or for the people. And Henry eminently agreed with this. The French Revolution began to unfold after the American Revolution, and it was known for widespread executions and radicalism. Henry began to fear similar circumstances could develop in America because of the populist unrest here, and so he became more friendly toward the Constitution. He was, in fact, asked to serve in several positions as Secretary of State, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Ambassador to Spain, Ambassador to France, and even as a U.S. Senator. But he declined them all, feeling that the best government was state and local governments. Ultimately, he died of stomach cancer on June 6, 1799, at the age of 63. Now let's take a look at some closing words by Patrick Henry. After the Revolutionary War, he had written a brief summary of pivotal events that preceded the war. He ended his remarks with these words. This brought on the war which finally separated the two countries and gave independence to ours. Whether this will prove a blessing or a curse will depend upon the use our people make of the blessings which a gracious God hath bestowed on us. If they are wise, they will be great and happy. If they are of a contrary character, they will be miserable. Righteousness alone can exalt them as a nation. Reader, whoever thou art, remember this, and in thy sphere practice virtue thyself, and encourage it in others. And in thy sphere practice virtue thyself, and encourage it in others. My name's Craig Seibert. Thanks for listening.